It is Bitcoin Wednesday. Bitcoin Wednesday, the digital currency revolution in the Netherlands. Register using the link on bitcoinwednesday.com. Hey, so hi everyone, my name is Matthijs Pontier and I'm from the Pirate Party. And I'm going to talk about uh, how um, uh, anonymous marketplaces like Silk Road can reduce drug-related harm and how they can also be a first step towards a more rational drug policy. Uh, right now there's, there's a big taboo on recreational drug use and it's mainly because of uh, government campaigns like this one. It says 15 bucks for sex is normal but on meth it is. And it creates a certain image of a drug user which doesn't apply to most drug users. Most uh, recreational drug users, they use drugs, uh, they have a good time, and uh, that's it. Maybe they have a hangover. Um, but uh, there's, there's a, just a small group of people that really gets problems with this, and they're not really helped with this stigma. What they need is better health care for them. Uh, but anyway, uh, there's a stigma on drug use, on recreational drug use, and because uh, drugs are also traded on Silk Road, there also is uh, a stigma on Silk Road, and it's basically guilt by association. And uh, one, well, a bit funny thing about this is that um, a law enforcement tries to uh, fight marketplaces like Silk Road a lot, and that's actually, in a way, the stupidest thing that they can do, because every time that they uh, fight uh, an, anonymous, an anonymous marketplace, and it gets in the news, the anonymous marketplace get much more popular and everyone, every time one gets down, there's another one coming up. So is, is um, our anonymous marketplace uh, significant in the total drug trade? Uh, I think it is. In 2012, Silk Road uh, accounted for 4.5-9% of the total market share of drug markets. And in the global drug survey of 2014, in which 80,000 people took, uh, took part, 22% uh, of the UK drug users said they brought drugs online and 10%, uh, so that's about half of them, said uh, they were doing this for the first time. Uh, there's one um, a remarkable thing about this is that the drugs that they buy are not the drugs that are the most addictive ones. They mainly buy cannabis, MDMA, LSD and hallucinogens and those are not the really addictive drugs that people get addicted to, and like uh, cocaine or heroin or crack. So I think that's uh, uh, remarkable. So let's talk about crime, because people think drug trade and producing uh, drugs is a crime, and it's, it's a crime by law, of course, but uh, should it be a crime? Uh, if you look at the history, then repression never stopped drug use. Um, and, and it makes sense, because if you, if you have uh, a demand for something and you start to repress uh, the supply, but the demand stays, then the supply will pop up somewhere else. So in, in Dutch we call this the waterbed effect, uh, but in English I think the, the balloon effect is more common to use, and it's, it's, you, you can see it here, if you, you just push it somewhere else and it doesn't uh, go away. And also if you look at uh, alcohol prohibition in the 1920s, you can, you can see this very well. People didn't start to drink less when alcohol got prohibit, uh, prohibited. But uh, there was, you know, the, the, the mafia came up with uh, Al Capone, he had his glory days, and, but people still uh, continue drinking alcohol, so they stopped alcohol prohibition. And the good news is that when they stopped alcohol prohibition, a lot of this organized crime went away. Only one third of the people uh, moved to other crime, and one third of the people, they continued in alcohol, but they, uh, in a legal way, and one third of the people did to uh, something totally different. So uh, we are saying if, if, um, if you want to uh, improve safety, then uh, make drugs legal and don't put cameras everywhere. Also, this organized crime really leads to civil wars. You can see here in this cartoon that um, a lot of uh, weapons are moving from the US to Latin America and the drugs are moving in by the demand of the US. And it's really devastating for Latin America. That, 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 that there's basically a civil war being fought for the, um, for the US drug demand with the weapons that they get from the US. There's a lot of financial cost to society. Only in the Netherlands, the, the societal dr uh, costs for drug-related crime are 17 billions per year, so that's uh, 1,000 euros per person per year. That's really a lot of money. And the police uh, really has their hands full with uh, enforcing these drug laws. 
police spend over 50% of their time, detectives spend 75% uh, of their time, and it, it's a huge drug market and they, they have to fight it uh, because that's a law and because uh, we give them budget to do that. And if you look at the, 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 the US uh, drug control spending, it's, it's really, it gets massively, but it doesn't help anything. You see the, the blue line is the addiction rate, it just stays the same. So the, the, all this money spent on um, dr uh, enforcement of drug laws doesn't really help anything. It's also a problem for science. Um, basically every drug has a medicinal value. And most drugs started as a medicine, even in cocaine and heroin, they started as a medicine. And uh, there's a lot of uh, potential medical benefits for drugs if you use them in a medical setting. But um, it's almost impossible to get a uh, research budget uh, to, to get fundings to, to do the uh, research into this. Now there are some organizations like MAPS and Beckley Foundation, they, they give money to researchers to, to research this anyway. And there are some really good results like using MDMA the, from ecstasy for post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, ketamine for depression, and, but uh, there's, there's much more potential in this. If we just uh, are able to, to give researchers funding for this based on whether it has potential, and not uh, based on whether something is illegal or not. Also, um, there's a lot of uh, drug-related health problems because of the prohibition. Because there's uh, an unregulated market, there's products with varying strengths, there's polluted drugs, and there's a lot of misinformation. So these UPS pills, they, they recently came up, they're really, really strong. So if people take them and they don't know what they're taking, uh, they, they really run a, a big health risk. You should maybe take one quarter of a pill and then you have the desired effects. And also we have the, the cocaine warnings in Amsterdam, I don't know whether you've seen them, but uh, actually white heroin is being sold as cocaine, which is really weird because white heroin is actually more expensive, so probably people don't know what they're doing, and they, they, maybe they stole something from other people, I don't know. People are still uh, figuring it out. But it, it went away, but actually recently it came up again in Amsterdam, so now you have the warnings again. And actually some people uh, really died from this. And also there, there's this girl. Uh, she was 15. She just didn't really know what to do. But she took uh, too much MDMA. And, and well, in the end she died. And now her mother is actually fighting to legalize MDMA. Because she's saying, uh, my daughter didn't want to die. She just wanted to get high. You know, she, she just wanted to have a good time. Um, yeah, so let's talk about addiction a bit. Drugs are not um, prohibited based on the level of addiction. If you look at the level of addiction, so this percentage says how, uh, which percentage of the users who use it once will uh, get addicted uh, at some time. So you see at the top there's tobacco. 32% of the people who try tobacco, try cigarettes, they get addicted at some point. And that's even higher than for heroin. So cigarettes are more addictive than heroin. But, of course, um, uh, you can much uh, easier live a regular life with uh, cigarettes and with heroin. But also then, uh, alcohol is actually pretty high. There's heroin and there's cocaine and alcohol is at about the same level of cocaine. And, and cannabis, for instance, uh, is a bit lower. Also, it's quite strange how people are trying to make stricter regulations now for uh, e-cigarettes and for cigarettes. Because if you look at the, at the harm level for cigarettes, and uh, this ENDS is the e-cigarettes, this, this is like really huge, and, and this is almost nothing compared to that. The, the main problem with the e-cigarettes is that you still get nicotine, so you still get addicted. But uh, if you look at uh, the, the problems for your health, uh, they are much smaller. So uh, I, I think it's really weird to make stricter regulations for e-cigarettes and for regular cigarettes. And there's a problem uh, about um, the, the, the public perception compared to the truth. And I, I think it also goes for cryptocurrencies. Uh, policymakers and many people don't have much knowledge about uh, cryptocurrencies and also not about drugs. If you look here uh, to, the, to the harm levels of the scientists compared to the public. So the yellow is the public and the green and the blue are two uh, different teams of scientists. Do you see that alcohol is the most harmful drug, then heroin, cocaine, tobacco, cannabis. But if you look at the, the, what the people think, then they think the, the least harmful drugs are in the top, like ecstasy, LSD, and magic mushrooms. And uh, it's, it's 
is almost an inverse. It's really strange how uh, these, well, apparently these government campaigns were really successful in scaring people for drugs and setting a wrong image. Also, it's, it's a bit, um, it's, it's, I think it's a really problem of freedom. Uh, if you use drugs, then you uh, hurt yourself, maybe, but you don't really hurt others. And we also don't punish uh, people for other risky activities in which they can hurt themselves. Uh, the, the professor that also did uh, the, blue, the, the blue study in here, Professor David Nutt, he also did a study in which he compared the risks of horse riding uh, to taking ecstasy. And um, it turned out that uh, horse riding was more dangerous than taking ecstasy. Uh, because with, with uh, riding a horse you sometimes get in trouble and if you take ecstasy and you know what you're doing, you're just hugging people and you, know, uh, you have a hangover for, for a few days, but, but uh, that's, that's the largest problem. If you, if you know what to do, of course. But still, um, if you look at what people actually do and how much harm they get, then horse riding is more dangerous than taking ecstasy. So why does, why does it stay this way? Who benefits from this drug prohibition? Well, that's the, the drug lords, it's the gangs, and it's, it's terrorists because they make money on drug trade. Also, it's the privatized law enforcement and prison because uh, privatized law enforcement, they get money to arrest people. So if there's more reason to arrest people, they have more work to do, so more jobs, more money. And the prisons, they, they basically uh, a lot of people compare it to slavery now, especially in the US, because they arrest people for doing something in which they do not hurt other people, and they put them in a place where they are locked up, and they make them work for, for incredibly small amounts of money in the privatized prison. Also, politicians have some uh, benefits, because they can just do some tough talk, and it, uh, intuitively it seems right, and well, it basically gets them votes because they seem really tough. Uh, also, you can look at who pays for the lobby. So who pays for the lobby to uh, keep cannabis illegal, for instance, in the US? Then it's the, the, the same group of people for a part. It's the privatized police and prison, you know, who make money of the drug prohibition. And it's also the alcohol industry and the pharmaceutical industry because uh, it's competition for them. They want to sell their own drugs, so they don't want any, want any other drugs in the legal market. And also see here, uh, when uh, Richard Nixon launched the war of drugs, then this was the population, prison population. And here where the war of drugs is launched, and you can see that it goes up a lot. <laughs> but there is uh, some improvement. There is, uh, cannabis is legalized in five states in the US now, also in Uruguay. And also in Europe, in Portugal, we dec decriminalized drugs. Uh, it led to a lot of uh, health benefits. There's less drug deaths. There's less, less HIV infections. There's less drug use among young people. So it has a lot of beneficial effects. <coughs> also, cannabis social clubs in Spain. Um, people grow cannabis for themselves collectively, and you know there's a club, and everybody grows for themselves the maximum amount, and it all works uh, pretty well because uh, it doesn't have to be grown by uh, people who are connected to crime anymore. Also, if you look at Silk Road and why people uh, use Silk Road, it has a lot to do with harm reduction, with safety, and with increased con consumer choice. So there's the, the top reason is better quality, which also will improve health. If people buy drugs of better quality and they know what the quality is, then uh, of course there will be less uh, drug accidents. And there's, there's some com consumer things like a wider range of drugs, high ranking sellers, convenience, lower prices, but then there's also avoid dealers. So people uh, are really glad that they don't have to um, interact with criminals to get the things they want and also improve safety. Also because um, with, um, with the, these, these anonymous marketplaces, uh, people get their drugs uh, from a dealer, but uh, they, they, uh, uh, via the internet, so it's sent uh, by a legal party, and that's the mail. So uh, usually they have to get it from a person who is connected to crime. Now uh, a person who produces uh, just sells it, via mail to the end user. So uh, a part of the black market is transferred to the legal market. So I think anonymous marketplaces can play a big role in, in um, uh, making a step towards a more rational drug policy and reduce drug-related harm. You have a more efficient supply chain, 
but you can also have uh, transparency in the supply chain and privacy for the consumers. So you have a transparent chain. Also, because, uh, because it's decentralized, um, at the Pirate Party we always uh, think in terms of uh, preventing power concentrations. So if, if something is decentralized, then you don't, uh, uh, you have less centralized power and uh, usually uh, things go wrong when there's too much centralized power. Uh, so it basically it leads to a lot of freedom. It's your brain, it's your body, it's your choice. Yeah, I think it's just uh, a bit weird that people should have to say something about what you put in your body. So what, uh, what I just talked about, at Fire Party we think um, decentralization of power is important. So also we don't want to regulate too much, because if you regulate too much, then you put the government in power, but you should regulate just a bit to prevent that other organizations, such as corporations or maybe uh, organized crime, uh, get too much power. So that's, that's where you need to find the balance between. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, um, the actual plan was to have a round the table discussion with, um, uh, with, with everybody who was here tonight. Um, a round the table is a bit difficult when you don't have a round table and everybody's sitting in, a, in, in the public. But um, I think um, we should try to well, have a discussion with everybody. And um, if, anyone, if anyone has a question, well, just please shoot. And if you have a question for someone else in the public or want to say something else, um, please. You mentioned the medical research for, for what are the bad and the good things of each drug. Yeah. Uh, did you know that because of these taboo things and that it cannot be well, so much research, uh, a lot of this research actually go to these uh, hidden markets or to actual uh, illegal users of these drugs to ask them mm -hmm. what did they experience with this so they can do the research even after they took the medicine? Well, do you mean this? Um, this research? Uh, no, the, the, uh, the medical research. Uh, right. Uh, th that's more about uh, scientists who want to yeah. uh, develop medicines. And uh, uh, what, what was your point then? Because so they, they, I discovered that they use actual users of drug and yeah. actual users of uh, markets like Silk Road mm -hmm. to, find, to, use, uh, to do their research because they cannot find subjects that the good Suitable right. For yeah, 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 yeah. I know there, there's people that do it. There's also uh, mm -hmm. underground therapists who experiment with uh, MDMA therapy, but they do it underground because it's not legal. Yeah, that's correct. Well, but uh, what they found is in this in the second market or in these uh, hidden markets, they found uh, research uh, um, subjects that they already experiment on themselves without knowing what they were yeah. doing. Of so course. Yeah. That's uh, if if you think something will help you, but it's illegal, then people still do that. That's, that's uh, with a lot of things, that's the case. More questions? Well, m maybe I have one. Is it actually all a big hype, uh, the problem which is, which people say is about uh, silk, silk Road and everything? Um, well, yeah, why, no, I, I wouldn't say, it, well, yeah. I, w I wouldn't uh, think about it in terms of a hype or not a hype, actually. Well, because of it's, it's, it's what's mainly advertised in the media, so that was why I was thinking of... Well, yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a, it is a relevant problem, but I think uh, just, you know, um, uh, more repression is not the answer. I think we uh, should look at the, the, the advantages that, that this technology can give to us and then uh, think about how we can improve our laws uh, using, these new, uh, using the advantages of these new technologies instead of only repressing everything that comes up. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ricky, where are you? Ah, there. Sorry. <laughs> um, what, what, what's your vision on that? Um, yeah. uh, the funny thing is, if you look at uh, that's basically what you are saying. Uh, people tend to always <laughs> step away from new things. People are don't like adopting new changes or changes in their life. People tend to stay exactly the same. They they always used to be. Uh, when they are not familiar with uh, new things. And that's probably the same for Silk Road. Silk Road basically just so there's a huge demand, uh, especially for designer drugs, which is uh, very uh, noteworthy. And um, uh, the funny thing as well of Silk Road is that uh, Silk Road uh, basically got busted. The whole website 
drop down, uh, was taken down at least. Uh, what you see right now is that you see a lot of new scammers coming up. And in the meantime, you see a lot of Silk Road versions 2.2 that are a lot better. And uh, the funny thing is we actually track people behind those uh, markets. And the, the, the cool thing about it is, is that it's quite easy as well to pinpoint people that use that website, pe people on that website that are actually the main traders. Uh, they actually have the people that all also sell the, the goods in, in very small portions. And those people are also just moving to, to the different markets. So those people are not actually going away. So busting silver didn't really uh, help at all. And I think uh, your last slides basically sums it up uh, very good. Uh, within 50 years, we probably ah, don't yeah. even understand why we are banning all those kinds of drugs. Yeah. And that's just takes time. Um, I'd like to with the politicians and the, the media um, in terms of that uh, um, shedding the stigma, what would be the best approach or the best way to do that? Well, I think um, just setting straight the, the wrong image that, uh, that I showed in the, in the second slide. Just, so just um, providing uh, good information and being honest and, and uh, just talking openly about how it actually is. I think that's the only way. More questions? Yeah. Uh, so Ricky, um, <clears throat> you talked about um, how it's kind of hard for criminals to cash out money from Bitcoin, right? To the real world. But then there's a lot of these dark markets where they sell drugs, whatever drugs. And to some people, these are also criminals. So how do these people cash out their, their money that they earn from the, the dark markets? Because there's a lot of money going on there. Yeah, the funny thing is that uh, there is not that much cashing out. Uh, the cashing out is on a very low level, actually. That's the reason why the FBI was able to confiscate a large, large uh, supply, at least, of uh, fired robots, if I remember correctly. Um, but they do it in very large, small portion, and if you tend to keep everything very small, you tend to stay under the radar of the police. And that's why Silk Road actually also works very quick, or very good at least, because uh, the portions of drugs that are being sent are very small as well, so you can easily send them by mail without getting caught. And it's not interesting for the police to arrest someone that is, has just bought three grams of weed or something. Uh, they always tend to go for the big fish. That's how that's done. While you're dealing on local bitcoins in Sweden, I've had a few offers of people selling bitcoins at that market price, a big percentage. And while I told this to other people I used to sell to, they would, they would like get large amounts of money to buy, but they would never ask oh, where, that, where are the bitcoins coming from. So I think a lot of this happens. If someone comes with bitcoins 10%, 15% at the market price, people are happy to buy without asking oh, where is it coming from. Yeah, so yeah that, that's a tricky part, yeah. And that's basically how you, uh, what we call uh, money mules right now. Uh, those are the people that are, tend to offer their service while they should know better. And that's a very tricky point for law enforcement at least to, uh, to deal with. And uh, right now, also those people do get arrested, but most of the law enforcement don't want to arrest those people, of course, because they want to arrest uh, the, the mastermind behind those uh, criminals. Uh, but those are uh, the side effects. <coughs> And I don't think you will ever get that uh, away. There's always people cooperating when they think they can earn a small portion of the money. Okay, well, combining your two presentations, uh, have you seen criminals uh, getting uh, bitcoins from the cyber lockers or, or, or stuff like that, and then transferring the bitcoins they had into, say, heroin or cocaine, something that has street value, that they can easily transfer into fiat money, which we all know is being used for a lot of criminal activity, and then being laundered that way? Have you seen that happen? Actually, I've never seen that, no. So I just came up with a great idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing is that uh, a lot of people think that cybercrime is connected to the underground world uh, largely, but that's actually not true. Uh, cybercrime is basically a very separated, organized crime that 
tends to have very smart kids that work on their own. And that's a big difference uh, when you look at cyber, or, or at least uh, the mafia sort of things. Uh, you do see that lately uh, those criminals, criminals tend to connect in a small fraction at least. But that's a growing thing at the moment. Cyber criminals are not that big right now. But we're still small. <laughs> Questions? Yep. question about money laundering. Um, the examples that you've given, the income is always in Bitcoin, right? But let's suppose that I have an X amount of euros that I got from some illicit venture somewhere, and I want to launder those. Um, can Bitcoin be used for that? Because I think you just shift the problem oh, I have a big amount of money here that I can't explain the origin from, and buying Bitcoin doesn't miraculously solve that problem or exchanging it. No. So I actually, as a tool for laundering uh, euro revenue of crime, it's more or less useless. Uh, yeah, that is true. Uh, I do know some cases where Bitcoin has been used to uh, smuggle money. So basically, if you, uh, with a large amount of euros, uh, you cannot cross the border, but you can cross it with bitcoins. Uh, <laughs> uh, but still, you have the same problem uh, with exchanging money back to, uh, to normal currencies. Is there actually anyone who ever used Silk Road, not for professional purposes like you, but just for fun or anything? Or is this just some <laughs> question which you should never ask? <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, well, for the speakers as well as, uh, as the audience, um, what kind of new services would we like to see or that we think should be developed that um, would address some of the stigma and actually perhaps even improve society or improve this situation, uh, improve version of Silk Road or you know, new ways of uh, minimizing the, the damage from uh, illegal drug use and so on. If you want to reduce stigma, then I think the key is in transparency because uh, what I just talked about was uh, just showing openly how things are, that that's the way how you can reduce stigma. Um, but then it should never um, conflict with the privacy of, of individuals. So the transparency should, go, uh, should be for, uh, for the, 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 the bigger parties, you know, that, that um, in some way uh, represent others because I think that uh, privacy ends where you start representing others. Does that answer your question? Uh, uh, only partially. So, uh, for example, uh, it may take a long time for politicians to come around to many politicians who are perhaps more conservative or more slow to understand. And we can educate them and talk to them a lot. I mean, as, as often as we have access to them or the possibility to talk to them. And that, that process is happening slowly. But, for example, in the US, things are changing. But what about, um, you know, otherwise, like um, the types of services where politicians would say, hey, um, that's actually helping the problem. It's Im improving things. Well, yeah, if, if, if um, people or politicians have a too negative image and are focusing too much on the negative things, of course, if you want to restore the correct image, then you should uh, try to let them focus more on the positive things so that the, 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 the netto focus is uh, correct, so to say. Yeah, but I mean, I, I understand in their minds that, say, problem, the problems are, um, uh, you know, cybercrime in general, and... Uh, and damage to users through drug abuse. So with the amazing digital currency revolution and what, what's happening and how quickly the technology is evolving, we will start to see a lot of new permutations and varieties of you know, new silk roads that, you know, that, that, are, that are resembling science fiction but are right around the corner. Um, 
can we already imagine what that might look like and that politicians would be really delighted to see those types of services rather than being afraid of them? I, I think politicians in general, uh, so not individually, but in general, are always afraid for everything that's new. And uh, just at the moment where uh, lots of benefits uh, become visible, then they maybe start to accept it. And I think with this it will be exactly the same. When we can donate to the parties with bitcoins, then probably they will not accept it. Yeah. <laughs> when we can donate to the parties? Yes. When oh, you can donate to the party party with bitcoins. So. No, only free campaigners in states now How does the college network actually do things? Or is he? Oh, there you are. Yes. What, what oh, I was wondering um, how you. I mean, you have you have a lot of young people, and um, they're all growing up and wanting to use drugs and everything. I suppose. Um, so. Some of them. Yeah. But but I, I, I suppose um, then Silk Road is something they might use. Yeah. You educate anything on that? I mean that that's how I learned about Bitcoin. Was, was I have heard about the Silk Road. So I think that was actually uh, uh, an entryway for a lot of people in just learning about the technology as if that was the primary use case for Bitcoin in its early years. And so I think a lot of young people were like, you can buy drugs on the internet and looked into it. Many of them never did, such as myself, but they still then learned about Bitcoin as a result. Okay. Any more questions or discussion points or? Sorry, I should use this one. <laughs> no? Okay, well, um... Thank you. Bitcoin Wednesday.